Hey everyone, welcome to this new mini series. This is going to be Earth Science Final Review Master Overview. This series is meant to do a full overview of the whole Earth Science course for the year. I just want to preface it by saying this is not going to be going into specifics. So as I go through the whole curriculum, if you see something that you're really struggling on or you need more of an explanation on it, pause the video, go into the link in the description, and you will see the whole playlist of the breakdown of every topic that I already made, and you can watch those individual videos. So this is going to be just a very big overview of the most important things that you need to know to do well on your Earth Science Final. All right, so this is going to be a couple parts because it's gonna go through a lot of material. So we'll see how many parts it turns into. A little plug here is this is what the playlist in the description looks like. So you can go through all the videos for every topic and pick ones you wanna learn specifically about. And if you can, hit the subscribe button because part two is going to be on the way shortly after this. All right, here we go. We're going to start with unit one, which is going to be the prologue unit. Just highlighting some important stuff to know. An observation is what we look for and notice the details about something specific. We're going to use our five senses to do it. So see, touch, taste, smell, and hear it. An inference is drawing a conclusion based on the observation. So it's like sort of a prediction. Rate of change. You should definitely know how to calculate rate of change. So you want to do change in value over time. So for this question here, 400 minus 100 is your change in value. So it would be 300 meters divided by 3 minutes. So you would get 100 meters per minute. And make sure you have your correct unit for that. All right, we got density. Density is the amount of mass in a given volume. So I like to think of it how tightly packed the atoms are in the substance. You should know that water expands when it freezes into a solid. So ice floats in liquid water. So ice is less dense than liquid water. Water is the only substance where its solid form is less dense than its liquid form. A couple of density relationships. As you increase temperature, your volume goes up. So the molecules spread out when you get hot and it takes up more space. This causes warm air to rise because it's less dense and cold air sinks because it's more dense. And this creates convection currents, which is going to be a huge thing to know in this curriculum. Here's your classic convection current. The warm air rises, moves over to the cold area, sinks, moves back to the warm area, and it makes these cells these circular paths. If you cut an object in half, its density stays the same. If you double the object amount, the density stays the same. So the amount of the object of the same material has no effect on its density. The density formula is mass divided by volume. You should know how to manipulate it in every way, and it is on the reference tables. All right, that's unit one. So we're going on to unit two, which is describing Earth. All right, first off, the Earth is not a perfect sphere. It is an oblate spheroid, so it looks wider than it is tall in my little exaggerated picture here. But you cannot tell on a real globe that this is the case. It's barely wider, so this is very exaggerated. You will not see the Earth like this. It looks like a perfect sphere to us, but it's really not. Since it is wider at the equator than the poles, you're going to weigh more at the poles because you're closer to the inner core. The Earth became an oblate spheroid because as it rotated, it sort of got wider, like making a pizza, as it spun. We have Polaris, which is the North Star. It is located directly in line with the Earth's axis of rotation. As you could see in this picture, it directly lines up. And if you're standing at the North Pole, you would see Polaris directly above your head. So we use it for navigation, and that will come up a little bit later. The altitude of Polaris is equal to your latitude. So if you are standing at zero degrees on the equator, 
Polaris is zero degrees high in the sky. If you're at 42 degrees, which is New York north, you would see Polaris at 42 degrees high in the sky. The best evidence we have that the Earth is spherical in shape, should I say oblate spheroid in shape, is photos from space. We can clearly see it. We got the lithosphere. The lithosphere is all of the solid material on the planet. So that's going to be all the land, all the rock. We have this chart on page one of the reference table. You should know how to read it. It tells you about the crust, hydrosphere, and troposphere. I put the synonyms above those, and you should be able to read this. Uh, rank the most abundant elements in the crust by mass and volume. And we're on to the hydrosphere, which is the water. This is a very thin layer. So compared to the whole Earth, the ocean is barely anything. Atmosphere, the air or gases that we breathe. It was formed by volcanic eruptions as the Earth was formed. That's called outgassing. And it's mostly made up of nitrogen, 78%, and then a little bit of oxygen and some other trace materials. There's four layers of the atmosphere, and they're divided by temperature change. You have to know how to read this chart on page 14 of the reference table. It looks like this. You should be very familiar with this. Know at the temperature, how that works, how to read the line, how to know about the pressure and the water vapor, how to know how the altitude works, the pauses. We got the stratosphere. There's not that much weather changes here because there's not that much water vapor, and it contains the ozone layer, which absorbs heat. It also uh, protects us from harmful UV radiation, so that's a very important thing to know here. So temperature actually is going to go up in the stratosphere as you go up. All right, we got latitude lines. These lines are also called parallels. They never touch. They go left to right, and they measure north to south. We start with the equator when we go to measure them. For longitude, they measure east to west. They are half spheres, like this shape. And the starting point for the lines of longitude is called the prime meridian. That goes through Greenwich, England. And it's actually the starting point of all the time zones. Longitude lines can go up to 180 degrees, which is on the opposite side of the prime meridian. That's called the international date line. And we also need to be aware on page three here, this New York State map has minutes on it, remember. So you have to know how to do latitude and longitude with minutes. So if you're looking here between 42 and 43 right here on the right, halfway would be 42 degrees and 30 minutes north. And then you may be over here, 74 degrees and 20 minutes west. Everywhere on this map on New York State page three is north and west, because it's New York, right? So we're in the northern hemisphere and the western hemisphere. You should be able to read the latitude and longitude on page four and five here. So remember the prime meridians here. So you got your east here, all the way here. And then your west is going to be from there to there. So I'm not going into how to read these maps, remember. So if you want to know how to read the maps, check the link in the description. You can watch the video on how to read this map. Again, same thing with this page. It's the same latitude and longitude. Know where your hemispheres are on this map and know how to get a coordinate. Places on the same line of longitude will have the same solar time. So everywhere north and south have the same time zone. So it's as you go east, time will increase, and as you go west, time will get less. And that's because the Earth rotates. So we rotate west to east, 15 degrees per hour. That's 360 degrees in 24 hours. And if you divide that, you get 15 degrees per hour. Here's the little rhyme that I just said. You have to know how to draw an ISO line, definitely. There's probably going to be an ISO line on the final, so make sure you're familiar with how to do this. Print out a handout, get a copy, type ISO line practice on Google, and start drawing these with an answer key. So, you know, if you want to draw 18, or we could do 17 real quick. You know, 17, go between the numbers that 17 is in between. Make sure you're hitting all your dots, right? 17. And there you go. All right, so definitely be familiar with those. 
we got our gradient. The formula is right here on the reference table. Change in field value divided by distance. It's like the same thing as rate of change, uh, except with mountains. So we got contour maps. These are going to be isolines that show the shape of the land. They measure elevation based off of sea level, sea level zero. So the smaller the circle on the contour map, the higher the spot. So the highest elevation on this map would be somewhere in here. Remember, where the lines are close together, that's a steep area, and where they're far away, that's a gradual gentle area. Steep means like a hill like this, like a cliff, and gradual means like, you know, like not that big of a cliff. It's like a gradual change. Closely spaced contours is steep slope, so that would be a high gradient. That means a fast change in a short distance. We got a depression. These are hasher marks. They have little dashes inside of them and they show that the area is going down. So just remember, it repeats the same elevation one time before it starts to drop by the contour interval. Contour interval is what each line counts by. The maximum elevation of a hill. So to find this, it's one number lower than what the next line would be. So if they want to know the x, what's the highest, these count by 20, so it would go 20, 40, 60, the next line would be 80, but it's not there, so the highest this could be is one less than that. So this would be 79. Minimum elevation is just one number higher than the previous contour line. So if you want the minimum elevation for x, it goes 0, 20, 40, 60. One higher than that, it would be 61. Rivers. Contour lines bend upstream. This is the sentence to remember for that. So you should be able to look at a contour map and know what direction the river's flowing. They also flow into lakes and oceans generally from mountains. They flow downhill, high elevation to low elevation. Just a quick example here. This Ert River, you can see the contour lines bending here, right? So this would be flowing this way, so south. You should know how to do a profile. I'm not going to sit here and do a profile with you. If you want to show, see my profile video, again, go into the playlist in the description, click on the profile video. I run through how to make a profile of this. All right. Well, the next part's going to be starting in astronomy because this video is already too long. So we're going to stop here. And if you want to check out the next part two final review video, please go check that out. I will go through all the units for the entire curriculum in this little series and good luck to you and feel free to leave a question in the comments if you have any questions all right good luck studying bye